Welcome to Linux for the Rest of Us, episode number 37. The show where we uh, talk Linux, and if you're a Linux noob, intermediate, or advanced folk, you will get something out of this show, and hopefully you will enjoy it. Let me introduce the co-host here, the man who brings the goods, the door-to-door -door geek, Steve McLaughlin. What's up, door? Hey, man. You know, just another exciting week in the geek household. Oh, yeah? You want to yeah. elaborate a little bit? Well, I, I, I got to start off with this. Yesterday, I owned an Apple product in my dream. <laughs> Are you serious? Yeah. You um, had a dream about owning an Apple product? Well, okay, first let me for a minute. Were you wearing my a black turtleneck? No. My uh, youngest son is sick right now. He has pink eye, sinus infection, ear infection, all three. Because of pink eye, he cannot go back to daycare. Okay. So I picked him up at like 11, took him to the doctors at noon. This was carefully planned out, let me mind you. Took him home from the doctor. As soon as he got home, boom, nap time. Let's roll. Any parent should follow this to some degree. When the kid takes a nap, you take a nap. Because if you try to play catch up with the housework and stuff when he's napping, you'll be exhausted and drive yourself crazy. So I said, I'm taking a nap. And I'm thinking it's the patch and the gum drugs in my brain <laughs> that made me have a very vivid dream. The gimmick was the Apple device was an, is not a real device. And I had to ask myself when I woke up if it was a real device. It was the iBoard. It's the uh, Back to the Future floating skateboard. Um, and the only thing I can think is in my logic, I do believe Apple devices are built with a certain amount of quality and insight into the product. I don't like their overall ideals and schemes, but a floating skateboard, I would want to be built with a little bit more insight. You would want it to be built, be built by Apple. I think so. But uh, it was a gray and silver board that somehow floated. And I remember skating down the street on it, went into like a 70s grocery store um, where I saw my mom, who is now, she's dead. But I stopped in, I talked to her with, in a little bit, and I showed her the uh, eye board, and she said, you'll break your neck. <laughs> and then I skated over to my wife's house, which I think would be my house, but I remember distinctly thinking my wife's house. Okay. You mean and just to say up. hi? You mean it was like Back to the Future style, like you, like she was younger, and like, or was it like just you went to see your wife at her house? Well, I wasn't fat, so I guess I would have to be younger. <laughs> um, and the one thing I do remember is right near the very end of the dream, which wasn't planned, yeah. I remember thinking, the physics aren't exactly right with this thing. <laughs> because the way I'm pushing, I should be going off at an angle, but I'm right. going straight. How does this thing work? <laughs> Boom, and I woke up. <laughs> That's great. Did it, so, did it have an Apple logo on it? Uh, yes, but I scratched it off. <laughs> well, did you put something over it? Yeah, I put a uh, Podnut sticker on the top of it. But no, 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 no. In, seriously, in your dream, you put a Podnut sticker over the Apple logo? Yes. Are you serious? And I don't know. The only thing I can think is I made the link between you and Apple. <laughs> so I don't know. awesome. Pod, when you dream about Podnuts, you know there's something wrong. And yeah, well, and when you dream about an <laughs> Apple device being a Linux user, you know there's something going on in your brain that you can't quite explain. <laughs> Dude, that's a great story. I love it. Thank you I for had sharing. to mention it. Because as soon as I woke up, I remember sitting up thinking, do they make a floating skateboard? I think that'd be cool. I'd like to have one. <laughs> and then after a couple of seconds, I was like, nah, they don't make it. Yeah. It would be it would be a thousand dollars anyway. Yeah. It really would be more than that, probably. Yeah. Well, you'd have to get like this eye skate or the eye board pro. Right. Cause I weigh a little bit more. <laughs> oh man. Yeah. Um, the first thing I wanted to jump off about is, uh, is, um, pod pod Buntu. And if you go to pod com slash current release, all one word, that's always going to be where the most updated, um, download is. Okay. Um, I basically just made what was already available via scripts and updates because you could have downloaded one from a month ago and then ran these update scripts and then you would have had the exact same thing basically. Um, but now it's available in ISO format. The only other thing I did, um, Simon Z Z Z Zarafa, 
uh, our Podnuts friend and a friend of security now who got mentioned on. I was just going to bring episode. that up. I heard that. That's pretty awesome. Huh. As soon as I heard it, I was driving in the car. <clears throat> I literally got off the highway, went to a red light where I knew it was a long red light, just so I could hurry up and type in to Twitter at Simon Zarafa. Cool. You got mentioned on security now. Yes. And then I went back on my road to work. <laughs> um, uh, he pointed out that when he tried to load the ISO file into the into a Grub4 DOS bootloader, which is a very cool, ingenious, multi-boot tool. You basically put that on the root of a thumb drive. Then you can just drop in ISOs of Spinrite, Podboontu, Ubuntu, Nopix, all kinds of different tools. And then you pick which one you're going to boot to. Well, Podboontu wasn't booting correctly. Okay. So he asked me if I could add uh, this one thing to the disk. So I did that. So that's the only extra above and beyond thing you're going to get if you download this new current a release and gotcha for those who don't know podbuntu is a it its end goal is a user-friendly distribution for windows computer techs that know nothing about linux and fans of podnuts and the podnuts media content community the whole nine so you just you just throw it in and install you just throw it in and boot to it and install it you don't have to know anything about linux well you don't even have to in um in a oh just run it from a live cd i'll stall it right from the live cd it's really main intentions right now are to run av scans on the hard drive because everyone out there should believe running a scan from inside an infected operating system it's more likely to miss things where if you run it from outside the os there's no rootkit running active virus running or something like that so it's more likely you're going to find things. The downside is you cannot scan the registry, and it does take a little bit longer. Okay. Yin and yang. you got to pick what you want. Um, I'm also going to add malware scanners to it, uh, malware bytes, super anti-spyware, yada, yada. And um, i got to say, I've gotten a couple new backgrounds from people. Great work, guys. I absolutely love it. Looking good. Awesome. Awesome. And um, there is a built-in audio player, Banshee, that already has pre-built in all of the uh, Podnuts feeds. Oh, sweet. So once you load it up, you're already sub um, subscribed to everything Podnuts. Really? Gets all the recent feeds? Mm-hmm. Oh, that's so cool. Thanks. Yep. Uh, you the know next... what? Um, before you go on that, you just reminded me. I'm, uh, Michael Davis, our friend who has been making uh, the Podnuts Roku app, is completed. We do have an audio Roku app now in the store, and we're going to have video really, really soon. So that's pretty exciting. If anybody has a Roku box, you can tune into Podnuts uh, on there as well. And so just wanted to put yeah, it out there. Thank it, you, Michael. And now you, I believe you can get one for as little as like 59 bucks. Yeah, they're, they're coming down. I don't know. I haven't looked at prices, but I know they're very getting there. They're getting there. Yeah. That's very you know, cheap honestly, free. it's not my favorite box, to be honest. I bought one. And I have it, and I use it, and it's just there's not enough buttons on the remote for me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like to me, the Roku really is intended for the TV lover, right. the movie lover, and maybe who wants to expand into the internet realm. Exactly. You know, secondary. Period. I think it's a good device just because it gets internet content out there, but I don't think it's my pick either. Right. Yeah, that box. You know, th you know those types of set top boxes. I can do with that. I'd rather hook up a computer or, my, hey, my Google TV's fitting the bill. So, Very cool. And that's Linux. Now for a segue, which yes. just by just by saying that I killed the segue. If you are a TV movie fanatic and you want to watch them on your computer, one of the hardest things to do is to get up-to-date content. It's right. almost a task to go out and find this you know, figure out how you're going to get it and download it. Now, if you're completely legal, there's only really legal and illegal, but if you're completely legal, you sometimes have to wait a little bit longer. You have to have iTunes installed. And on Linux, it's really a pain in the butt. You know, the Amazon store has some things, but not everything. For those of you really, truly, and honestly dedicated to watching up-to-date TV on your computer, there's really only one choice right now, and that is to not be completely legal. <laughs> With that said, 
use at your own risk. Um, and you really need to uh, be aware that technically this is illegal. I will state, if you just install this and you just run it, you will get a letter from the DCMIA, DC, whatever it's called. Who cares? The RIAA, about? right. The Digital Copyright Millennium Act from the RIAA stating you're breaking the law. If you want to know how to get around that, look for yourself. It's not hard. But this is a very cool application. It's called Downpour. Um, I just saw it today and I just tried to install it today. I had one issue on my Ubuntu box. Um, and that's because this is not in the repositories in the Ubuntu Software Center or the Package Manager. If it was, then all the dependency conflicts would have been automatically handled for me. Um, what this is, this is a browser-based automated torrent downloader via RSS feeds. Right. Um, if anyone is into the uh, deep into the act of um, cutting the cord, as uh, Tracy Holtz calls it, of getting rid of your cable or satellite provider and getting everything online. There are very well-known Twitter feeds, Identica feeds, um, friend feed feeds, all kinds of different feeds that basically are only there to exist to give people direct links to up to the second torrent downloads. Sure. And, what I, and what I mean by up to the second is the biggest loser starts at nine, ends at 10, at 10.02, that feed is in that torn file. <laughs> That's so awesome. That is very ingenious, I'll say, the way they do that. Well, you know, at that, I guess you could say this is illegal, but if you get a down, if you get a torrent that fast, it probably still has the commercials in it, right? Yes, and to be honest, I feel like this is a big, huge gray area. Right. If I can freely record something off my TV and then show it to my wife and that's not illegal at 1002 you would be showing it to your wife right how is it then illegal for me to download from the internet and watch that same exact thing this is not like hbo premium channels you know this is just regular tv i'm talking about now of course you can download anything you want i agree anything you can find so i, I you know and that's why i'm talking about this and obviously steve this isn't for me or you we're both I don't want to say TV haters, but we find better things to do with our time than catching up on Jersey Shore <laughs> and other things. But you're right. This is something that if I did really want to watch an episode of, I, I wouldn't feel horribly ba bad or dirty for, for watching a show an hour after it aired with commercials. Right. And it, honestly, when I watch it live, I fast forward through the commercials. That's true. You Me know? too. I, um, I create the buffer. You know what I mean? Create the buffer. Yes, I do. Okay. I do the same thing. When a football game starts, I, I turn it to the channel, then I hit pause, mm -hmm. then I go fix myself some to eat, play with the kids for a couple of minutes, do something else, and yeah. then like 40 minutes later, I start to watch it so I can just bling right That's through awesome. stuff. The, gotta love yeah. the buffer. Yeah. Um, this is what this essentially is. This is a web-only interface, so you have to install a, uh, a, a, a Apache as the web server. That's your interface to this application. And this is a insanely cool application. It's written all in Python, so it's pretty snappy. Technically, you can install this on Windows using uh, SigWin, which is like a virtual layer of Linux on top of Windows. I kind of don't suggest you do that. I would rather get an old box and put this on there. Um, but this is to me like kind of the beginning of people getting their um, faith in cutting the cord. I see. And I'm always a fan of that. Sounds good to me. Nice little app. Yeah. yeah. Uh, now to jump back a second, if you want to watch these videos, I talked last week about how to set up a VLC share in Ubuntu and then have it accessible via a web browser. Now in the story, it's how to make it accessible in um, Android. Okay. Um, and I'll say this, I did this today. It works perfectly well in any browser. One of the reasons is when you get ready to go start to watch a video, it has a, a transcoding profile that is easily changeable on the fly. Uh, the only downside I'll say to this on Android is 
The only video player I could find truly compatible with this was V player. And that's what they mentioned in their um, thing. Only the only freely available V player is a free trial. After that, I think it's four or five bucks. So I think it's worth playing with to see how much you would use it. And if you're downloading all of your TV shows, this yeah. might be another way to experience the um, media. Now, the only downside I will say is it does not on the fly transcode the video to a more appropriate format like uh, orb.com. I talked about years ago. It's a Windows based solution that does pretty much the same thing. It makes your pictures, songs, videos available over the internet via a client or a web page. Um, it on the fly sends a couple packets, gets them back, determines the network speed, and then in, then it in, uh, intelligently streams it at a uh, network friendly bit rate. This does not do that. So you have to make sure that it is in a uh, portable friendly format if you're on your Android, for instance, or if you wanna stream it over the actual internet all you have to do is open up a port on your firewall, bing, bang. And then you just got to make sure that um, it's it has to be friendly for your upload bandwidth. So there are some caveats that come with it. I will say when it when I figured that out, it worked pretty flawlessly, right. pretty smooth. It even remembered my position. So when I started to watch video, stopped it. Then on a different computer, loaded the same video, it picked up in the same spot. Huh. So that no, I'm kidding. Good. Yeah. I, I love VLC, man. It's so versatile. Yeah. Now I say we cut right here and we jump to the email uh, about VLC versus Apple that we got from uh, Michael Davis. Michael Davis again. Yeah. Let me pull up. Okay. I'm going to take a drink of carbonated beverage. <laughs> no problem. Come on, Gmail. Okay, VLC versus Apple. Here we go. Steve yeah. and Steve, I hate to have come to Apple's defense, but Dora's remarks regarding the pulling of VLC from the Apple App Store is a little hasty, are a little hasty. Some video land developers spent a lot of time developing VLC for the iPad and submitted it agreeing to Apple's App Store terms of service. Those terms clearly state that all of the content is protected by DRM. It is here that video land knowingly broke their own license. Remy Dennis Cormont, another member of Videoland who did not work on the iPad version of VLC, sued Apple for copyright infringement when the app that Videoland themselves uploaded did not conform to VLC's license. Dennis Cormont knew that uh, knew full well that Apple would take mobile VLC out of the App Store after receiving the suit. The Videoland developers who worked on mobile VLC were upset with Dennis Cormont, not with Apple, and I believe they are correct. While the App Store does not technically allow for GPL'd content, Videoland knew this going into the agreement and submitted their app anyway. I'm sure hundreds of hours of manpower were wasted because Dennis Cormont had a bone to pick with Apple and with no regard for his fellow developers. You can debate propriety versus open source all you want, but this entire thing is not Apple's fault. The open source community are the ones taking the issue, are taking issue with mobile VLC being available on the App Store, not Apple. This whole thing has made me stop licensing my work as GPL and instead license with the BSD license. That's Michael Davis. I'll say, yes, he's right, but it still to me does not negate the fact that Apple's licensing standard is bad for people, bad for growth, bad for common sense, bad for users. What's wrong with it? It basically says anything totally open and totally free, you cannot put on our store. That's not good. Yeah, that 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 is very bad. That's like having, you know, Apple owns that pathway of applications. It's like saying, you know, you can only come on these roads if you promise to keep your mouth shut forever. Hmm. And then those are the roads everybody's traveled. Those are where all the ads are. You know what I mean? So it's really stifling innovation. And in the end, I think it's going to hurt Apple. My belief. I will say the BSD license makes more sense to people who have, um, um, I don't want to say corporate interest in mind, because that's not really fair to say, 
with a more business savvy about them. What's the difference? I'm an idiot when it comes to the, what is the difference between GPL and B BSD okay. license? GPL means what it was is what it is is what it's going to be. It's free. It's open. It's free. It's open. It's free. It's open. You can never change that. The BSD license says I can take a Apache, for instance, which is under the BSD license. I can take it. I can modify it. I can tweak it. I can hide my changes, and then I can sell this as a product. Uh. So, in in a lot of people's eyes and mine included that makes the bsd license more free because it has the option to not be free i see what you're saying so i am a fan of the bsd license but either way i think it's very stupid and a very poor taste for apple to offer a market where you can get free products but the all the products themselves cannot be free with a capital f and yes, I know the guy did it on his own recog and the VLC developer didn't like it. I appreciate the fact he did it because it brought this to the front. It made people now more aware that anything in the Apple store cannot be GPL'd. So there are a lot of applications you will never see in that app store. Now the app store's on the desktop too. So it's only going to be worse. Hmm. So I will... Holy hardly admit he is right, but it doesn't change the fact that Apple's a bunch of buttheads. Okay. <laughs> That's just my belief. Yeah, but they make a badass floating skateboard. Uh, super badass. Um, and I definitely want to thank him. I do, one of the things I said really early in, the, early in the podcast, which I don't want people to forget is, if I am incorrect, send me an email telling me I am incorrect. I don't like saying something with resound saying I'm right and I'm wrong. Right. If I'm wrong, let me know I'm wrong. I don't want to spread falsehoods, but okay. Apple's a bunch of buttheads. <laughs> um, That's okay. subjective. I don't know. You can't really get in trouble for saying that. I know. It's a, uh, you know, I'm not saying, you know, Jobs is a child molester because he's not, I hope. Because <laughs> I really do, I really do like the guy's um, business savvy. I will say one of his things that I truly adhere to in my entire life, but I did it before he said it. So that makes me cool, but I didn't say it. You always under promise and over deliver. Hmm. Don't promise something. If you're not over a hundred percent positive, you can do it. You always want to promise something that you think it's possible. And then when you over deliver, the people are just happier. Yeah, that's great advice. That's great and that's advice. an, and to me, that's in all facets of life. You know, when I married my wife, I made it very clear I'm an idiot. Take it easy on me. And now she's pleasantly happy because I'm not a complete idiot. <laughs> so great. Mm -hmm. Good job, Dor. Thank you very much. Uh, the next link I wanted to talk about, it's on ZDNet, which I really kind of hate sometimes. Oh, you, you know what, Dor? We got to go back. Uh, the, the link. Let me just talk about the links that we went over. The one okay. for the VLC thing was make tech easier if anybody wants to go to that. Um, yeah, we right. will have these in the show notes, but I just I, I I usually like I usually like to mention them, but I forgot. Um, oh yeah, that's that's it. The other ones are all self-explanatory. ZDNet. Yeah, yeah. Down and uh, downpour is D O W N P O U R. Very easy to find. Yes. Okay. Um, cool. This one's on ZDNet, which I kind of hate, it, but it's quiz. Are you a Linux guru? And, you know, off the air, Steve, I've told you many times, don't call me a guru. Don't call me a maven. I'm not a maven. But I'll say I got a little bit of a puffy chest feeling when I went through this quiz. Yeah. Um, I want to say there was uh, 11 total answers. I got one wrong. Nice. So I felt good about myself. Um, this is not anything really detailed or super hard. A lot of it. Somebody into Linux for the first year should be able to answer seven or eight of them. You know what I mean? Well, Just I... by paying a um, attention. Hmm. Like the very first one, uh, starting with acronyms, Linux is packed with acronyms. Uh, what does GNU mean? I got now, that this one is, right. I got that one right. Right. Now, this is your typical multiple choice thing back from school where a couple of them are really stupid. Uh, and then you like one or two that might be it. Right. Uh, A, it doesn't stand for anything. B, GNU, GNU's not Unix. C, great near Unix. Or D, goodness not 
Unisys. I mean, you know, I picked B. Good man. Um, and it just goes on and on. What, the one thing I liked is it actually tells you a percentage of what people answered. And I'll say on the on one of them I got wrong, I felt very good because more people answered it wrong than right. So I felt better about that. And that was like question eight or nine. Uh, some which, guys, one, which one was it, Dor? I think it was um, uh, number... Oh, we got to go. You got to go all the way through to get to. Okay. Well, no, no. At the bottom, oh, you yeah. can click the, click the numbers. I think it was number eight, and it was uh, going back to first. Which was the first popular ma major Linux distribution? Slackware, Red Hat, uh, C CPM80, or Gen Two? I wasn't really aware back then, so I got that one wrong. And the correct answer is. Well, you guys will have to take the test to find out. Right. Um, and I can't remember, there was another one that really blew me away where Microsoft was involved in the answer. It was, um, what company has never sold a Linux distribution? And Microsoft has, right? Yes, I didn't know that. Yeah, I it was didn't number know five. either. I, I would probably would have picked that too, but you, since you said right. that. Yeah, it was number five. Which company has never sold a version of of either its own Unix or Linux, and it was Microsoft, Dell, IBM, and Lenovo. I kind of misread this a little bit because I know Lenovo, IBM, they're kind of the same company. I know one of them offered laptops with Ubuntu on it. I know Dell currently offers devices with U Ubuntu Office, so I immediately went for Microsoft, which was the wrong answer. <laughs> but either way, I think it was fun to do. You know, yeah. you can learn a little something as you uh, go um, through it. That looks pretty cool. I'm, yeah. I'm curious to see how bad I fail on it. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. But I, now, but now I'm allowed to call you the well, at least the guru. The guru. Okay. It's official. All right, it's official. You passed. Um, then the next thing I want to talk about real quick. There's a lot of things easily customizable in Linux. You know, the backgrounds are easy to customize. The panel or the taskbars are easy to customize. The themes, very easy to customize. One of the more difficult things to even comprehend what it is and how to customize it is the bootloader screen. Okay. Uh, and in and in, U, and in Ubuntu, the default um, bootloader is Grub. And Grub might be an acronym too, I don't know. But... um. It's Grub 2. Grub 1 was very text editor friendly, I'll say. Grub 2 is not as much. It's a little bit more high end, many more features. To the end user, it just looks the same. And it looks a little old, looks yeah. a little crusty, looks a little plain. Um, on, how, on How to Geek, there's a post called How to Customize the Ubuntu Bootloader Screen. And if once you, especially once you up, update a kernel in your operating system, you almost always see this bootloader screen. And it's just 19, like 92. Come on, man. Who cares how a bootloader screen looks? There are many people out there that care, <laughs> let me say. I personally don't because I always, I'm the guy that always powers on my computer, then walks away and then comes back. But if this is just another way, to be honest, the, this is kind of like comp is. The only reason I can see somebody doing this is so they can turn to somebody and say, hey, look. Huh? Yeah, huh? exactly. Huh? That's exactly right. Right. But there's a very simple package I never heard of in the uh, package manager called Berg, B-U-R-G. Right. And this package allows you to set some defaults on uh, Grub, including changing the image with which I got to say, I like it being available. I'm not going to do it. Right. But I like the fact that it's available so people can go in and they can customize it, especially in a easier fashion. Yeah, it's, it's nice. Thank you for mm -hmm. Berg. I mean, this is something I would do if, like, I like, did video editing for, like, two hours and just need a little break, but I don't want to get up from my computer and I sit down and I look at the computer, my Linux computer. What what can I do with this thing for that'll take five minutes? And that's the kind of that's where this fits in for me. Yeah, still cool, yeah. still cool. Yeah, and like to be honest, the the place where I would do it is if it was a custom bootloader screen, either on my Nokia N810 
or my Android device only because every time I boot that thing, I'm sitting there staring at it going, come on, come on, <laughs> come on, you know? Yeah. And on my computer time, turn it on, walk away, go get caffeine or nicotine gum. <laughs> um, I told you yeah, I, rammed my, I rammed my phone again, though. Yeah, you are turning into a little ROM machine. Well, I, I, after Cyanogen, I couldn't get wireless tether to work, so I loaded Destroyer again, and that didn't work. And I got Warm something. It's called Warm something, and it's uh, it's it's uh, it's the HTC Sense, but like HTC Sense two or the newest Sense. Really, really pretty. We'll talk about on Android Android app addicts. Yeah, I'll say people who you sense seem to really like it a lot. Um, I didn't like it. I thought it was boring and old, and but this is snazzy. It's very elegant. Put it well, here's way. my only question. Destroyer, how was that spelled? Was it spelled like it, the normal word, or I did think, that have some spelling? I think it was normal word. Okay, because I tried to look for it once, and, you know, gay, 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 OCD said in, so I gave up quick. Yeah, I, I, I didn't find it by typing in destroy. I found it by typing in best Evo ROM, or something like that. Gotcha. Anyway. Okay, um, the next thing I want to talk about is really has a nasty habit of being the root of every single time me or someone else I know has an issue with Linux. It's almost never um, corruption on the file. It's almost never configurations because configurations are typically well documented, how to get something to work, how you want it to work. It seems like it always comes back to permissions and it's like I said, you know, a long time ago. Security, convenience, opposite ends of a pole, the two ends shall never meet. You will always be leaning more towards security or towards convenience. You, If something is really convenient, the odds are it is very insecure. I mean, there are a very few exceptions like the, um, oh, God, what's it called? I can't remember what it's called now. The Yubico YubiKey. Okay. This is the exception of the rule. This is both ultra convenient and very secure. The problem is it doesn't work in a lot of places. Really? That's pretty so cool. That's, you just carry that around in your pocket? I carry it around because every 45 days I change my corporate network password uh, with this and then I set it in static mode so not even I know my own password <laughs> to get into a domain and I'm the only user in my enterprise that is a domain admin and gets a warning when they change their password saying it's not Windows 2000 compliant because it's so long <laughs> so that makes me feel better so the people at your work that they use the YubiKey? No, oh, their do, passwords you... are the bare minimum they have to be, which okay. to me are not long enough. They, so you, you, it, just, you, you just bought that for your own just to be safe. Yeah. Cool. Uh, I, cool. And I was really hoping more websites would pick it up because it's real, it's real true power is one-time use passwords for websites and banks. If only they more places would pick it up because it's, it's actually, for what it does, it's actually kind of cheap. You can get it for around 22 bucks. And there's no moving parts whatsoever. There's a little sensor pad that it's like um, not resistive, conductive. When you touch it, you have either a touch or a tap and hold. Right. And it can tell the difference. And it basically any user with no rights on a computer can use this because when you plug it in, it emulates a human interface device of a keyboard. Wow. I never saw yeah. one. That looks pretty badass. It looks like a little flash drive. It's a basically. Dong. It's a dongle. Yep. yep. And I keep it in the case just because I don't want it to get scratched up. Back on permissions. Yes. Um, understanding the permissions is a little bit of a task versus the Windows world. In the Windows world, security is horrible. We should all know this and believe this even if you don't use Linux. How many times do we hear about zero-day exploits Poning devices, getting system and admin access, and controlling the operating system and doing whatever they want to do. And, you know, you didn't type in something. You didn't go and do this as an administrator. It's because security is lax in Windows, and it's not a true multi-user environment. It's one of those things they don't want to make it too secure or else they get too many phone calls. Okay. 
it's a corporate executive decision. Linux, there is no corporate executive business decision. It's just about making the best product they can make. Hmm. And it is truly multi-user. Um, the best example of that is if you go into virtually any GUI, you right click on a file, you go down to properties and then permissions, you'll see there's three groups of access. There's owner access, group access, and other access. Um, I'm 99% sure other access are like um, unidentified network users. Okay. So you can set the owner with read, write, read, write, execute, um, only execute, only read, only write, all these kind of things. Same thing with the group, same thing with the unknown people. In Linux, this equates to very fine grain control, which at the same time means if there's so many options, there's more to go wrong, I'll say. And the biggest hurdle seems to be with down with downloaded binaries. Whenever you download them, they're not executable. You double click them, the wrong application opens and you, as a new user, you're just befuddled. So if you understand basic permissions, you will go very far, very quickly. Um, the link is muktware, M-U-K-T-W-A-R-E.com. Understanding permissions under GNU Linux systems. Yeah, and I'll say um, a lot of people who have any experience with FTPing onto web servers or modifying permissions on a web server for a file, they're kind of used to this. They've, they've seen in the past accesses that look like 777, 644, and these groups of numbers. Each number represents owner, group and other and it's uh one two and three they're the three values right no one three and four my brain's fried if your brain's fried we're in trouble because i have no, oh, no. idea well it adds up to seven there's only three of them <laughs> one two and four one two and four that's what it is okay and you can you uniquely add those digits up in every different way and get a different number every time all three of them combined is seven read write execute so if everybody in the universe should have access to this file it should be seven 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 oh uh, okay the first number is the owner the second is the group third is the other and on most web servers you at least want that last character to be a six or two whatever one of them <laughs> basically right click in a gui makes it easy for the uh, newbies. And of course, yeah. in the command line, it's a, it's a very simple command of chmod, change mod. And you can easily change permissions with that command by using a plus x for execute, plus r for read, plus w for write. Okay. That's, that's the easiest way to do it in the command line. And just being able to comprehend the basic permissions I guarantee you will make it a much smoother transition whenever you run into a stumbling block. I know for me, it took like three months before I ran into the first thing where I needed to know this. And I wish I would have found this back then. <laughs> um, or of course, a good IRC channel back then. Cool. Yeah. yeah, this is definitely one of the more useful links I'll say I will talk about. Muktware. Um, Muktware. Now, the next one is definitely not as serious unless you're married or you're living with a significant other one. Introducing your honey to Linux. <laughs> Let me say this is something else I really wish I would have had a while ago. Um, it's really like a touchy feely piece. But if you go through and read it, it does give you little tips and hints on like the angle of attack, you should go with this. Because um, really, this should not be an overnight thing. With me, it was an overnight thing. The wife sat down at the computer one day and said, what the hell is this? I said, oh, this, this is easy. Just go here and click that and click that. And then I very quickly realized whatever I had on a computer she needed to touch had to be spousal approval. It it it. It had to have a certain amount of simplicity behind it, which means a more heavy distribution with a much more easily understandable GUI. So Ubuntu is the one I stick with 
and I just make shortcuts right on the desktop. If for Firefox, because I use Chrome, I don't want her to see my Chrome. So she launches Firefox and to uh, the word processor in the spreadsheet and the calculator. That works. You know, this is actually a pretty interesting first paragraph of this story. He says, um, a couple years ago, I bought my wife a new ThinkPad. Slash top blogger Chris Travers. Uh, this, a couple years, I bought my, my wife a new ThinkPad. Slash top blogger Chris, Chris Travers recalled. She made a specific request. I don't want to use something weird like Linux. Though the laptop came with Vista, it never worked right. And then he goes on. But that, I love how the wife says, I don't want to use anything weird like Linux. Yeah. And I can tell you right now, my wife has said to me more than, more than a couple of times, huh, you and that damn Linux. <laughs> you know? Um, and the one thing I'll say I publicly disagree with him with is he gave her Fedora Linux. Fedora Linux from, okay, I'll state it is one of the best distributions for the community and for the calls and for Linux as a whole. It is fantastic to have around. I love their goals. I love their objective. I love the work they do. The distribution in my eyes is not newbie friendly. Uh-huh. And that, that wouldn't be a smart thing to do then. It's not, but of course you you should always give someone whatever you're comfortable with supporting, irregardless of what it is. Okay. You know, I should not tell, you know, somebody go ahead and install OpenSUSE 1104. It'll be great. First time they come back to me with a question, I'll be like, oh, right. well, well I, I heard it was great. <laughs> yeah. Well, and to, be, and to be honest, that's one of those distributions. I know they do some things great. For instance, you plug in a printer. I'm going to talk about this printer thing because Last pod nuts, they were complaining so hard about HP printers, which I got to say, I love HP printers. It takes me 45 seconds to two minutes to install and configure HP printer <laughs> because I'm on Linux. Right, right. When I'm on Windows, I want to throw them at the window. Exactly. Um, but like OpenSUSE, if you plug in a printer and turn it on, and if it is recognized by the operating system correctly, which it will be, but more importantly, if the driver is already preloaded, or they know about the driver, you literally touch nothing. And OpenSUSE will correctly identify, install, and put default configuration on that printer to where you can start to print five seconds after you plug it in. Hmm. Awesome. But I don't use it. Um, <laughs> and, and, I, and the one thing I got to say with this posting is you really need to baby step this, like, you know, don't let the misses or the or the significant other use Internet Explorer. Put on Firefox, which four got launched today, which looks a lot like Chrome, or Chrome on the computer, and have them get more custom to that. Don't let them use Microsoft Outlook. Have them use Thunderbird or another one of the multitude of free email clients. If she uses, you know, put the GIMP on the computer, put other applications that are cross-platform. So when the time comes, it's less of an issue hmm. to uh, change over. Okay. Yeah. But this was a pretty good article overall. I thought they made some very valid points. And uh, it was from a real person's perspective because like one of the paragraph paragraph titles down farther are i'd be sleeping on the couch <laughs> yeah it looks pretty cool it looks like an interesting read yeah it was definitely cool um now this next one honestly once i saw it steve i ain't gonna lie i got a little giddy um but i can't do this to my car because it's a new car and i can't do it what'd you get it's um nissan versa it doesn't even have power windows or power locks <laughs> i remember yeah. the commercials for them saying how much how roomy they were I tell you, the headroom is pretty insane. My father-in-law is six five, yeah, and he sits in and he has a good like two inches above his head. Nice, right? Of okay. course, on the Omega Mail, she got the Nissan Ultima, with, <laughs> you know, all the clicker and stuff. But that's, that's right. okay. That's okay. <laughs> you got to pick your battles. I also pick where my money gets spent. <laughs> um, this next one is a Lennox car PC. Oh wait, dude, I gotta, I gotta do the link again. The, the link for the old one, the uh, oh. past story. I'm sorry, I'm, that's my fault. I keep dropping the ball on that. Um, gosh, let me go back. It was technewsworld.com. The story is introducing your honey to Linux. Check it out. Yeah, sorry about that. Then this um, next one's timekiller.org. Right. This 
you know, everybody's talking about the Microsoft Sync, which I believe is a decent in-dash system. Yes. Um, and Android's coming to a couple cars, which I know is going to be a pretty cool system. But you also got to be aware that um, systems like these that are out there are, some of them are remotely hackable. There could be a guy in the next car. Granted, it's not easy or it'd be done a lot, but he could remotely disable your brakes. Really? With, with stuff like this. Yeah. Um, there's a firm in, uh, I believe it was MIT. I think it was MIT. Now they had physical access to the car first, but they were able to remotely disable the brakes, remotely turn the car off, things like that. And it le and it, it starts off with the car companies integrating these systems together instead of isolating them apart. Okay. This is a separated system. This is a Linux car PC. Linux guy, car PC. Yeah, the guy goes through not only step-by-step uh, -step features of like turn-by-turn -turn GPS navigation, listen to music, watch videos and m movies, control audio with the uh, steering wheel knobs, view pictures in a slideshow, download local weather and info, browse the web with Firefox, connect to cell phones with Bluetooth, yada, 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 yada. One of the things it can't do yet, which he said he's working very hard on, is ODB2, codes and connections. Um, for any car buffs, you know, um, the computer access uh to the car is by the ODB2 connector. You plug something up that recognizes that, and then you can get error codes off the car. So you know, well, this tire's a little bit low, the engine oil's a little bit low, you know, different things you can get out of it. And that's one of the things he's trying to put in this. Um, it looks like he's made good headway, I'll say. And he also goes down and he lists every single little detailed of hardware that he's using on this. And he has step-by-step -step pictures, maybe not exactly step-by-step, -step, but close to step-by-step -step of how he put this whole thing together, including the in-dash touchscreen monitor. Um, not bad, not bad at all. Now there's no doubt in my mind, if you've already used the Microsoft or the um, uh, in-dash system, you might look at this and say, well, I wish it did this other thing. You know what I mean? It's it, If there's somebody totally new to this, I have very little doubt this would completely blow their mind and fill every need that they would know of. And, um, and plus, it's, you know, it's updatable. It's a computer. It's updatable. You don't have to wait for Microsoft to dump down updates. I mean, you could hack this thing. You put whatever you want on it. Right. And now to be technically um, sound, you could connect your cell phone to this. You could install the VLC share at your house. And you could on the fly while you're driving stream video content to your kids. <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad you said to your kids because I thought you were going to say you could stream no. video and while you're driving and well, watch it and crash. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> there's no catch on this to turn off video when you're driving. So be responsible. Yes. Now the now the one thing I'll say that old only feature in here that makes me a little bit concerned is turn by turn navigation. There's a whole bunch of different levels of quality of turn-by-turn -turn navigation. On my Nokia N810, I had turn-by-turn -turn that I used to get to the Podnets party a couple years ago. Yes. And, and it worked. I experienced no other turn-by-turn -turn be, be uh, before that, so I thought this was great. Now I have my Android phone. That turn-by-turn -turn back on the N810 is unusable. Right. Because it is not as smooth, it is not as fluid. Do you still have that thing? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've offered it to more than a couple of people. I said, if you want to play with it, send me any money for shipping, I'll send it to you. Info Lookup said he was. Jonathan Adu said he was. Uh, one or two other people said they were. Nobody's ever sent me money. That is how in demand that thing is now. Well, and I said to them all, look, I don't even care if you break it. I really don't. Just have, you know, experiment with it. If you want to try something, try to load something, have fun. And they were all like, oh, that's cool. Info's like, I, I can use it to hack. And, uh, Jonathan wanted to see how accessible it would be, and nobody's gotten back. To it. <laughs> it's available. 
out there, if you're familiar with the Ponce community and I've seen your name more than five times, I I'll ship it to you. I don't care. Um, but yeah, this is the kind of cool customizations that are available with Linux. Because like I said before, it's a very scalable operating system. You don't need to have quad core 16 gigs. Right. No, he, it's, gig, a, it's a small hard. little system. Yeah. Timekiller.org forward slash car PC. Yep. Um, and one of the next things that I kind of, um, honestly, it left my brain for over a year. And I was reminded about it from uh, DistroWatch podcast, which I got to say, if you're not listening to, if you have any interest at all in Linux, you should listen to it just to be able to stay on top of things. Very good reviews, very good news articles. Um, the thing I want to talk about, it used to be called Jolly Cloud. Now it's called Jolly OS. That comes with a caveat. Okay. What this is, it's all the same thing. Okay, let me get that from here. Everything I want to talk about is the very same interface and the very same content. You have to create a Jolly Cloud account and changes get synced up to the server. What that means, of course, is you can install it on one computer, log in, you install it on a second computer, bang, you have the same interface. But it goes much further than that. This is right now the number one portable desktop on the Chrome Web Store, which means you can have the very same interface on your Chrome browser on your desktop computer. You launch it, it looks very similar. All the apps are there. It will work just like it will if you installed it as a native OS. That's cool. Um, the other thing it gives you the available to do is you can install it as an application on top of Windows and get the very same interface, the very same interaction, and the very same experience. Um, I really like that idea that they're doing. You can get to this from multiple ways. So you can literally leave Windows installed on your computer, install portable grow, uh, Chrome browser and install this and you can see if it does things you like or you don't like. One of the coolest features though is the social feature, which means if you don't know anybody else running this and you don't try to find anyone else that running this, that has zero added value. <laughs> but if you can find somebody else running this, you can literally like an app and they can see that you liked it and it's almost like a suggestion. Uh, there are like inline uh, chat um, channels to where you can send messages back and forth to other users as well. No, wait, we need to what, what, go over what this is so I just grasp it exactly. Um, f there's two things now. So Jolly Cloud is an app you basically run on your computer and it presents a desktop and it's, it's cross-platform so you can install it on almost anything and s so you have an almost identical looking desktop on your devices. Well, it is the one that's publicized the most, and it is a installable version of Linux. So you can literally put it on your computer, wipe out the entire operating system, and just have this. That's Jolly OS. Okay. That's Jolly OS. You can take that very same experience, and you can install it as a Chrome, um, what do they call them, add-ons. I see. Okay, okay. it's Chrome add-on. So it's a, either a Chrome add-on or an OS. I see. Or a installable executable on windows okay there so it's an app an add-on or an os but and it's all the exact same interface no matter which one you use well i'm sure certain options are taken out of the yeah. add-on and the uh, desktop interface that only apply to if you have this installed as your full-time os like a network manager you know you don't need to connect to your wireless network if it's a add-on or an app on your Windows box, you're doing that in, inside of Windows. I see. This looks you know, really so, friggin' neat, I gotta say. And I will say this is, in my eyes, one of the most polished versions of Linux I think I've ever played with. Um, and the uh, package manager uh, interface is one of the most easily to understandable and uh, simplest to use interfaces I think I've ever used. So what, they they hacked the interface just to make it usable? Yeah, what they did was they um, basically have um, a cr 
critiqued applications where users rate them, the ones that get a higher rating are up far on the list. When you go to the app store, um, it's basically like an app store. You go there and you see the highest rated, the most used, right. most downloaded first. And then it's like um, a web page where there's 20 on this web page with good icons and little screenshots. And then you can keep going through there or you can search to find what you're looking for. I like this, man. It's really cool. Yeah. This is, and to be honest, this was one of the few and I mean the you that was pretty usable on my triple E 600 megahertz. Um, this net. was usable. It was pretty usable. The only thing that wasn't was the friggin' browser. Firefox <laughs> is bloat. I like it. I respect it. I like what they do. I'm happy it's open source, but it's bloat. It's heavy, 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 heavy. So what I loaded was Chromium. It loaded quicker, pages loaded quicker. It was still close to being really usable. Hmm. Um, there are many browsers I could use, but I want JavaScript and I want Flash because I'm a sucker, I guess. <laughs> Jolly Cloud, J O L I C L O U D dot com. Yep. And, and it does look like one of the things they link to, and I've seen more than a couple online live desktops do this is they link to office live yeah i saw that so you get like integrated microsoft document support right so you know i i i honest to god believe this is one of those things worth looking at for any computer user period yes i agree it's a good one okay um the next thing i wanted to prevy with one of my core beliefs here is if anyone comes up to me with any question about software, computers, GPSs, phones, or anything, any good tech or knowledgeable person typically always responds with a question back at them. You know, somebody says, what's the best phone I should get? Well, do you like touchscreen keyboards or do you want a physical keyboard? You know what I mean? Because yes. I don't feel like you know, because best is always this fluffy idea that really is never sure. It's never 100%. Nothing is the best. It's what you want it for. And one of the questions I've been constantly getting is, what's the best server for Linux? Well, the first question is always going to be, what do you mean by server? What do you want to serve? Here's a quick list of all the different types of servers. And this is not all the different types of servers. This is a beginning of different types of servers. Samba server, which is like file sharing, your typical network share, a NAS, if you will. File, okay. Second is a, uh, a uh, Apache, which is a web server. You can right. have a local intranet in your own house. Right. You know, uh, my SQL server, you can use as a, as a backend for applications for their databases. Sure. FTP server, which most people want to, have that available outside their network so they can connect, upload files, download files off site. Cubs, a, a, a cups server, which is a print server. All it, its main priority in life is to get network requests for print jobs, order them correctly, send them down to the printer in a orderly fashion. And it's the kind of uh, server that gives you the availability where you're in our office. You can say, okay, with every page, print a header page and on the header page, say what user printed it. Uh, I see. Because if you're in an office, the worst thing is you walk up to a printer and there's 50 pages in the printer and you have no idea where these pages came right, from. Right, that's pretty cool. Cup. I was going to so, say what a boring server Cups is, but that since you started... Oh, don't get me wrong. It's boring. But once you get it working, it's useful. And it's one of those things you never have to worry about again. Yeah, it sounds pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the next server, to be honest, is one of those things I suggest anyone with the extra box you should do. And this is a bind server, which is a DNS server. This can make your internet browsing experience much snappier, much friendlier. And if there is some kind of DNS poisoning on the outside or some DNS server goes down on the outside, but your internet connection is still up, you'll still be able to browse the internet just fine. Huh. Everything will work. You won't even know there's an outage. Huh. 
Um, the next is a DHCP server, which granted it's a little niche and people's routers do this, but it is technically a server to where you can be rest assured these kind of devices will always get these IP addresses and there's nothing to worry about when you map drives back and forth. Um, the next one is a firewall, which even home users can get use out of this to make sure their son, daughter, guest, whatever, cannot go to malicious sites or sites they don't deem appropriate. Okay. Uh, the next one is a proxy server. A proxy server basically can reroute and cache data. So if you have bandwidth caps and you're really worried about bandwidth caps, you can set up a proxy server. So if your wife goes to YouTube 500 times this month, all of the content that is the same, like the logo and the header and the footer will only be downloaded once huh. to your local cache. So you're essentially saving bandwidth. That's pretty neat. Yeah. And it, it, to be honest, it's very useful even if you don't have bandwidth caps just in the speed up alone. Because if your computer only has to go to that proxy server to download the Facebook logo, the YouTube logo, and all this right. like right. stuff, right. it's going to make it appear like your internet's faster than it actually Much is. Much faster. Uh, the next one is a SSH server. This is another one of the servers people like opening ports in their firewall and have it public facing. SSH is a secure way of sending commands back and forth inside the network and outside the network. And you can really do much more than that. You can mount file systems. You can turn on services. You can turn off applications. You can reboot computers. You can do a lot from there. Uh, and the last one, from where I got it from, to me, this is extremely mislabeled. LDAP server. And it describes it as network shared address book. That's not what LDAP is to me. <laughs> LDAP is a centralized user management console to where when you log into a computer, you're not logging into the computer. You're logging into the network, which means you have the same password on all your computers. It all gets synced and permissions can be handled on that server amongst other things, each user's email account. So when someone just says, what's the best server? There's a lot of different choices on what a server is, what it can do. You should just read this list and just spin them. <laughs> it will yeah. be like, uh, thank you. And then you'll, you'll, they'll never talk to you again. I'll say when people at work ask me that kind of question, I typically do <laughs> make it a 10 minute answer to which it's a weapon. They don't, they don't know what to say. It seriously, yeah. it is a weapon. No, this, I think it's a great list. I feel educated from this. Well, it is because to be honest, some people wouldn't even realize, wait, I can do this on my server too? Because all this can essentially be on one box. There's no reason why it can't. Or you could have separate boxes right. for some unforsaken reason. Right. But you can literally have all these on one box and you can really have a extremely powerful yet resource light system of being able to speed up your network, right. speed up your communications and share information. Do a lot of things. It's really badass. Right, and then when, if they, if I get an answer back from them, then we can start looking at what kind of hardware do you need okay. and what distro would be best use for you. Huh. Um, Very cool. Okay. Yeah. The next thing I'll we'll talk about, I jump back to Yo Linux, <laughs> which I got to say, I just like saying Yo Linux. It's a great name of the site. <laughs> it is. And I cannot thank Knucklehead Tech enough. He's the guy that really introduced me to this site. And I've been finding countless hours of knowledge and to be honest, enjoyment of just looking at this kind of stuff. Really? Yeah, I'm a geek, I can't help it. Um, besides having an ultra cool logo or a image on this screen, this is a very handy article for anyone that takes their internet security seriously. Um, a lot of people, e even on Windows, they just willy nilly have their pants wide open like anything could happen and you know they're not protecting themselves from anything you know what i mean and some people think well <laughs> once i go wide open. <laughs> well i i couldn't think of another i have smd on the mind i couldn't think of any else um a lot of people have the default belief well once i go to linux i don't have to worry about that kind of thing 
Right. It's kind of true. It's kind of not true. Yes, you can get pwned by a exploit on a browser to do things on your computer you don't want to happen. The likelihood of it happening, I think you have better odds of hitting the lotto when you're on Linux. Unless it's a spear phishing attack where somebody's directly, I want to get I want to get Steve C. I want to get Steve C. Right. You know? um, but here's a good um, write-up about internet security and servers. Um, servers need, in my mind, the most attention towards security only because you don't log into them every day and you might not notice changes every day. Or on the desktop, most of the time, it's more noticeable even though they're more likely to get infected. Just because you won't see it as obviously, I think it's a little bit more serious. Um, they go through a very long list. If you just page down, you're going to see a lot of page downs. And this is about locking down the kernel from uh, being written to uh, how to correctly configure a local firewall, how to uh, protect your daemons from being re-started uh, without your permissions, how to lock down a Apache. Um, every application in existence has some kind of exploit known or unknown in realistic. I mean, Notepad on Windows has exploits, okay? The calculator on Windows has had exploits. <laughs> the, the help in Windows has had very well-documented and abused exploits. Hmm. So everything can have exploits. This basically gives you tips on tightening things down so they're less vulnerable to those exploits. If you're in a business environment, this is much more needed, I'll say, versus a home user. But either way, I think it's a very interesting, I don't want to say read because it's a lot to read, but it's a very Huge. interesting glance over. Well, that's one thing with, with Yo Linux, I can tell you. They don't short. No, it's endless. Any Right. They, I mean, if there's something that's worth talking about, they look at every possible angle of it and they give very concise descriptions and examples. That, and that's what I'd like. They give examples. Um, so I highly encourage anyone who is security focused or, dare I say, paranoid, they need to go check that out. Awesome. And that's at Yo Linux. I just like saying Yo Linux. <laughs> Um, the next thing I want to talk about, I honestly don't know what I think about it. Having older family members that really don't comprehend computers, I generally think this is a good thing. But I will say I seen zero screenshots of the actual operating system or anything else but I'll say hardware wise, I think this is a good thing. This is on oh, friggin' ZDNet again. Um, Linux for seniors. Kiwi PC builds a Linux PC for grandma and grandpa. This is a small form factor computer with a very colorful keyboard, uh, which is intended to be. Um, I believe I want to say a starting price of $500, which to me really doesn't bring it down enough in price. To me, senior citizen, fixed budget, fixed income, they should really shoot for $300. But, you know. I don't me. know, Dor. I don't know. I, I That's a tough one. I used to be of the mind that... I, I Honestly, I think people will think that computers are still... Uh, seniors still think computers are more than a thousand bucks. So this is a steal for them. True. And going to KiwiPC.com, I can see the operating system they're running is Ubuntu. And they're not only running Ubuntu, they're running the Unity desktop on Ubuntu, which I do believe is a similar... No, that's not the right word. I don't want to say easier interface because I don't think it's easier. I think it might be quicker to comprehend but certain things I think in Unity that I've seen are buried a little bit too deep. Uh, everything should be two clicks away in my eyes, and some of the things are like four clicks away. Hmm. But I'll say at least someone is doing it. I believe it's a step in the right direction. I do think 
you know, when time goes on, we're going to have better choices. But for right now, I think this is a good piece of hardware. Um, Reg Exorcist, who I believe is in the lounge right now, he basically talked to me a little bit about doing a puppy install for his parents. Um, and the best possible thing I think he mentioned was the ease of customizing the start menu, quote unquote, to where you can literally in puppy make that font to be huge and easily visible. You can easily put in the five or six or seven things that they're going to use right there in that menu. And honestly, I think that alone, giving it that personal touch, I think is what's needed when you're going to try to get someone to use Linux who is not friendly with computers, right. I'll say. So I like the hardware. I like the size of the hardware. I don't know why the keyboard is so colorful, <laughs> but it is. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to mention that because it's been in all the news channels here for the last couple of days. Seriously? Yeah. It's interesting. Well, the Linux world hops on very wide ranging things. <laughs> Um, the next is the last thing I want to really talk about. And it's, a f I don't know about you. I agree with John C. Dvorak on tech five. Almost every time I see one of these frigging posts saying the 10 best, this, the eight top that, the whatever, usually two or three of the things in that list are complete bull and don't belong in the list, but they had to get to the number 10. <laughs> I mean, so right. they, so, so that's what they did. This is on uh, PC world and it's 10 ways Linux is making life better. Did you find that out that applies to this article? I personally think so okay. uh, because they take making life better as an ultra vague right. uh, range. Cause like number one is Android. I don't know if I would say it's making my life better. You know, I think it's cool. I think it's good for Linux. I think it's making my phone, my portable device usage more enjoyable and more dynamic. It's not increasing my, you know, it ain't making my life better. It ain't making me healthier or anything. But I, I, in a vague sense, I agree with it. Right. Web o, and they have WebOS on this list. I've never even used WebOS. That's the one technology bought by uh, HP, owned by Palm. And they want to put this on every computer. I don't know how Microsoft's going to go for this, but they want to have this as like an alternate operating system on every computer they ship. And this is a Linux-based operating system the GUI I've heard from everybody is very nice, very usable, very understandable. They what do they want? They want to get away from Windows, huh? Uh, I would say because they own it, they definitely want to push it. Right. I but I do believe right now they don't have a choice. Windows is where their market is, right. is at. Um, the next thing we're harking back to what we just mentioned niche PCs. And, you know, we've talked about more than a couple of times, the smallest Linux computer, um, you know, computers geared for a single task, like the Linux car PC. I do believe these niche computing devices make things easier, like uh, the Pogo plug ain't the best device in the world, but right. what it does, it does very well. And it's right. powered by Linux. Yeah, um, I could see niche, definitely niche stuff. Yeah, then it's set top boxes. This is where most people don't even realize it. You know, there are TiVos, and you know, their set top boxes most of the time are running Linux in one shape, way, or form. ATMs. If there's a public facing ATM running Windows, I guarantee you that bank is going to lose money soon enough. <laughs> um, in vehicle PCs, which we just talked about, Wikipedia, Google, and more. I'll say the majority of popular websites on the planet are running Linux uh, because of its scalability and because of its um, security of how often it's updated and fixed. Um, number eight, one laptop per child. I do believe that's a good thing for the planet. I don't know how much use those places get out of it. Uh, number nine, government. I'll just say for my government job, Linux is very slowly crawling into the system. 
it is saving us money, but it's a very slow, methodical pace. And then number 10, IBM Watson. This is this list is really stretching it. I concur. It's good. No, it's a good list. It gives you some stuff to think about, but he should have named it something different. Yes. Watts, how, Watson is a stretch. He's running yeah. on Linux, though, according to this. Right. Oh yeah, it, it 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 it's absolutely running Linux because it won. Um, but you know that's just my belief. <laughs> One of the things I heard is they're going to focus Watson's engine now on healthcare, and that kind of scares me. Oh, are you serious? Yeah, I I, I heard that like two weeks ago, and it it kind of scares me. I don't want Watson to make a diagnosis on whether or not the hospital should spend money to try to save me. <laughs> yeah, seriously. <laughs> Yeah, that's a waste of Watson. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, you want to do the closing thing after emails or before emails? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, after. All right. Let's read some emails here. <clears throat> let's get hot and heavy with some emails. Uh, Google Voice email. No. Here we go. This is from Donna. Um, I cannot find the show notes anymore. What am I doing wrong? I'm looking forward to reviewing them after I listen to your podcast. I said, what What show are you talking about, Donna? She goes, Linux for the rest of us. I'm sorry. And I, I thought this was cool. Um, I sent the email from the Linux for the rest of us page. I'm a 74-year-old grandmother and having a great time learning Linux. I love door-to-door -door geek as a teacher. I listen to the podcast while working in my garden. And then when I get to the computer, I would look at the show notes to follow up items of interest. Now I can't find the show notes. Glad to hear you're a fellow Floridian. Hope you are all well, Donna. Donna, we got the show notes up to date. Um, and I just thought it was cool that, you know, Donna, I just don't think there's a lot of 74-year-old grandmothers listening to the show. And I think that that's really awesome and something to remark about. And I wish she was my grandmother. Well, she loves you like a grandmother, Dora. She says, put it right here. She says you're a great teacher. I thought that was cool. Thank you very much, Donna. And Donna... If there's ever any topic you want covered more, I will definitely push your request to the top of the list. <laughs> there you go, Donna. You know where to reach door, and we're going to go over it at the end of the show, too. This one's from David. He said, hey, guys, I came across your podcast after chatting to a friend on Amateur Radio, and after downloading episode one, I was hooked. I've been running Linux since December 2009. Um, after 15 years of being a Microsoft user, and I don't know why I didn't make the move earlier. I now run it on four PCs and a home-built server in the home. As my main as my main hobby is amateur radio, I run Ubuntu 9.10 on an Acer Aspire One and AO 751H. It's the same. It's the one with the GMA 500 Pulse Bow chipset. It's connected to his radio gear, and it just sings. With my other three P three PCs running Ubuntu 10.4 and the server also. I have to date helped over 30 PC users move from Windows to either Ubuntu or Linux Mint, and I've only had a couple phone calls asking me simple little things, Un unlike when they ran Windows, when I used to get lots of calls saying my PC's running slow or I've got a blue screen of death. I've now caught up with all your episodes. I've learned, lo I've learned loads along with a couple of other Linux podcasts I subscribe to. I have to thank my in-laws for helping me make the switch to this great OS as they bought me the netbook. Keep up the great work, and I'll keep listening. That is Dave from Dudley, West Midlands, UK. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for that email, man. We love hearing that. And um, you really, you really going into this full throttle, man. I think it's awesome, and it's it's killer that it's working out for you like that. That is real cool. And I'll say, I too only get—I don't want to say dumb questions. I get much simpler questions from the people I've converted. And it's like, I just had to do a, a cleaning on a HP DV 9000 with Vista. Oh man, that's that, that's just wrong on many levels, what you just I, said. I, I seriously lost more hair in the last week than I've lost in a while. And it's because I truly believe Vista is the worst operating system ever made because it's <laughs> so many boxes. And just, and the thing had a gig of RAM, which I'm always in my Linux world. A gig of RAM, that's plenty. What are you talking about? That's more oh, than enough. To for do Vista, do. that's just like yeah. death. And, it's death. Well, and, and what I can't comprehend is he said, my computer's acting slow. I wanted to say, it's always been slow. <laughs> you know? And I was hell-bent to not do a reinstall because with a reinstall, it takes 
12 plus hours to download all the updates. 12 plus hours. That's I'm just serious hilarious. Well, because my whenever I do a Vista from Restore, which I'm kind of favoring now, it's never up to date. It never even have has SP1, and it's just updates, updates, reboot. Yes. Up, and what, it, what I really can't comprehend is just hitting the thing to say check for updates sometimes takes 20 minutes. <laughs> that is insane as far as I'm concerned. Windows XP with 256 megs of RAM wouldn't even take that long to just ping a server and get That's a true. list of available updates and it's tell you true. what you need to install. I know, man. The Micro Center was selling Acer laptops with Vista Basic with 512 megs of RAM. Oh, I'm like, my... no. See, and I'm not going to blame Microsoft for that. The hardware manufacturers chintzed yep, what chinsed. they should have been putting on there. Big time chintzed. And to be honest, that was when a bulk of users first started to use Linux because they could not stand the performance and the insecurities that came with Vista. When it was first out there, well, first off, to get a printer to work took three hours of brain surgery. Then you had to go spend $300 on a new printer. Right, right, right. But it was so insecure when it first came out. It was getting pwned so really? easily. I, I think it is Microsoft's fault. Man, I know I pick on them a lot. I still use Microsoft machines, but it is their fault. These hardware companies probably had no idea that that, that much memory would not be sufficient. They probably, it was probably a total wake-up call reality check for all of them. All of them. What? Yeah. One, gig of, one gig of memory is not enough? They're probably saying to themselves. So, I mean, right. I think it's, it's both their faults. Yeah, and I do agree because for like eight years... One gig was deemed too much, you know. Five twelve was plenty, plenty. Exactly. You know, so they so they got used to it, kind of thing. Right. And I will say, everyone who has said, "Well, in Windows Seven now it's all fixed and better," no, no. Right now, right now, there is four. There's like four hundred and twenty-two active zero-day exploits not patched in Windows Seven. Okay, right now. That may be so, so. I, dude. I can only imagine there's a, there's exploits all the time, but as far as performance and RAM, it is a step up. Oh, oh, it's a huge, huge, huge step up. But this is why I hate Microsoft. It's it's not because it's exploitable, but it's because they're so slow to fix stuff. Eh. With to be honest, with Linux in the last three or four weeks, I'll say I've heard three podcasts, and I'm pretty up to date on my podcast. Talk about exploits. When I got home that night and I checked for, or I didn't even have to check for updates, it told me there was updates every time the fix was there. Really? Every single time. The speed of patching in Linux is incomprehensible to a Windows user who's up to date on security. <laughs> well, and I'm happy he switched. Very well done. Robin says, on the last episode of Linux for the Rest of Us, you mentioned making a Podnuts game. I I thought an MM, uh, an MMORPG would be ideal. I do know what that is. It just I didn't read it right. Um, I I thought an MMORPG would be ideal. You could put in all the Podnuts guys as NPCs and have different towns or areas related to a specific show. I looked around for some great or for some game engines. The only open source one I found was Arian. RPG, A R I A N N E RPG. It uses Java, so it's multi platform. From the examples, it looks very flexible. And that's at arian.sourceforge.net. Then there is Eclipse. It is Windows only, and I couldn't get it to work in Wine because of a DirectX error. But apart from that, it's probably the mm. easiest and fastest way to get a great game up and running because it has an in game editor. I haven't tried this recent version of Eclipse, but I've, but in an, an old version, I had up, I got it up and running with my home network in 15 minutes. Gave myself building rights and could edit the map and NPCs as, as I was playing. Hmm, that's pretty cool. There's probably a lot of other good game engines out there, so don't stop looking, everyone. I want this Podnuts game to become a real thing. I do, too. Keep looking, Dude. guys. Keep digging. You guys should get together, meet up in the lounge or the team speak in the Podnuts forum, make a game. I Go crazy with it, you know. I'm, I'm all for it. <laughs> I think it would be super funny and super cool, so definitely. Yeah, I'll just say if it's the e Eclipse that's used for Android development, I know I downloaded it in, in my Ubuntu, and I did have it working just fine. I didn't think it was a Wine implementation. Uh, when I But when I go to the Eclipse website, all I see is um, 
download for uh, Windows. But let me, you know, oops, I think I lost door. Um, the link that Robin never gave the link for Eclipse, so, so he or she, I'm not sure, Robin, um, sent an, another uh, email, and the link is touchofdeathforums.com forward slash Eclipse. So it's touchofdeathforums.com forward slash Eclipse. That's the link. Let's get door back on the line. You there, bud? Yeah, I got to stop hitting the space bar on this, this computer really quick because <laughs> that's all right. It, it, it did the hang up, and I didn't know that was coming. Um, I'm 99% sure. You don't even have to go to the website with Eclipse. I think it's in the package management system. I think that's how I got it. Oh, okay. Now, they, they, now the website, adults, by the way, is touch. I, I, they, Robin sent another email. It's touchofdeathforums.com forward slash Eclipse. Okay, then it's, it's probably a different Eclipse because there is a extensible uh, platform IDE in this package manager called Eclipse, E cell, E C L I P S E. It might be that. This this is the forum, so it might maybe it's just a link to the Eclipse's real site. But this is the link that Robin gave. So Yeah, I can tell you if you do get anything like that, even started started, you need to go to SourceForge, you need to create a project. We need to get it in a Git repository and I would be more than happy to devote some kind of time into helping this done because I want to create the Chris Berry part of these because he has to be a boss. He has to be, you know, someone big and, <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> that will be very fun. Oh, I can't wait to see you guys go crazy with these characters. Awesome. All right, well, that's it for emails. Um, no voicemails. So if you guys do want to send us emails and have them read on the show like we did so um, so well, this episode, <laughs> uh, you can send us an email. You can send us a mail at send, me, send them to me at mail at podnuts.com or you could contact Door directly, which uh, I'll ask him where he wants them sent. And if you want to send us a voicemail, just call 7076 Podnut on a phone and uh, you'll get to our voicemail. Door, where could, uh, what do you want to say before we close off here? Well, I'll say first off, you are the kind and gentle leader of the Podnetsian land we don't have a standard of naming a naming nomenclature yet but i know but it was a pod a pod <laughs> nazi <Nutsian>? nazi leader. <laughs> leader you're a very respected pod nazi leader thank you um the one thing i wanted to say was if you don't know how to get in touch with me i don't care get in touch with steve um i just want to say if you are in the um uh ho if you're in the area of hey of ho why he either in Kona, Wakalua, Wamia, or Kahola. Man, I hope I'm saying them right. It's making me you thirsty, need, whatever they are. I know. You need to contact uh Jonas at uh at uh www com computer repair Kona dot com that's k-o-n-a uh i'll say he's not paying me for this at all he did me a very personal favor that i didn't even ask him for uh i know he loves linux and i know he is a very capable windows technician so if you're anywhere in that area and you need support you need assistance or a family member does and you really don't want to deal with them he will be able to take care of you and do a very good job that sounds good. Great plug. Appreciate it. And that is going to be it for today's show, guys. Thanks for watching Linux for the rest of us, and we'll see you next time.